everyone on the station loves to track this guy down, the former Celtic, all over media covering Boston. He's Brian Scalabrini to preview the NBA Finals here on Sean and RJ via the DNM Leasing Hotline. Good morning, Scal. Good to have you back. How are you? You know, I, a lot of people ask, but I say no to most. I like you guys, so <laughs> that's why I'm on the line right now. A lot of people have been asking, but you guys are always the best, and I love your energy. Did you just become so big that you now have to, like, shut shut down these requests? <laughs> well, I, I do think when it comes to – my number is everywhere. It's like plastered on every uh, producer's <laughs> bathroom, and they're like, anytime you're in a jam, this guy would say yes. <laughs> <laughs> and it got a little out of control there for a second. Okay, well, we appreciate it. You are great, so we had to track you down. Brian, your initial feel like on how good of a finals matchup you think this will be? Good. I think, um, obviously, there's storylines, and it's always good for the game. You know, you have the whole Porzingis thing, the Kyrie Irving thing. So those are always good, and that happens a lot more in the NBA now with player movement. But uh, I think it's unique that... It does seem like the Boston Celtics are the better team, but it, it does seem like Luka Doncic is the best player in the series. And a lot of times when you're talking about series, you're talking about the best player. And I think a lot of people, if if they looked at the March 1st matchup, they saw like the Celtics, and I'm going to be honest, they had the, I think it was our best offensive game of the season. The Dallas Mavericks are clearly so much better defensively than they were in that March 1st matchup. And Luka Doncic, I thought he did, uh, you know, like I thought the Celtics did a decent job of guarding him, and he had a 34, 37-point triple-double. So there is a lot of storylines to this, and it does seem like a great matchup. And if he, every Boston Celtic player, obviously, they, they know that they're trying to go into a game with all the psychological warfare. But the things that Luka has done to some of the other stars in the NBA, you cannot ignore that. You know, when you talk about how uh, Luka went off, and, and Boston obviously is one of the best defensive teams in the NBA, how do you expect them to guard Kyrie and Luka? We've seen teams come at it with a, a couple of different, you know, attempts, whether it be double teaming or trying to play him straight up with really good defenders, length on Luka, strength on Luka. How do you expect Boston to approach taking Luka and Kyrie out of the game as best they can? Yeah, easy. The number one way they're going to attack him on the other end of the floor. And they relentlessly went at Kyrie and Luka throughout that entire game. Um, and I didn't want to take in the January game because you guys made the trade and you guys are a much better team since then. So you got to use after the trade deadline. So the uh, on the March 1st matchup, it was consistent. They were moving the ball, finding that matchup quickly and attacking that matchup and then going from there. You know, Porzingis made a big difference because Lively and Gafford were getting pulled away from the basket, so they couldn't help. And those guys have been awesome. Like, they were unbelievable in the Minnesota series, especially Gafford when Lively went out. And they was, and, and Lively's been amazing. I mean, and the analytic numbers for a rookie big man, that usually takes like two or three years for them to figure out, he's been great in this series. But what they're going to try to do is move those guys around and then attack Luka and Kyrie. And hopefully, you you know, you kind of wear them out. I do think that you'll see a lot of Drew Holiday early, maybe a, a lot of Jalen Brown late. But you will get that Tatum-Luka matchup as well. One thing the Celtics got to try to do is keep Derek White on Kyrie Irving, keep Derek White off of Luka Doncic. White is an excellent defender, but he's not good against those heavy bodies where they put their shoulder into you and they just kind of navigate you. So I like White on Kyrie. It's like he moves his feet really well. He's got really quick hands, great anticipation. I think you'll probably see that matchup as much as you possibly can. Uh, Scal, in terms of Ke uh, Porzingis, how do you expect them to work him back in the lineup? I think uh, if I know the sports science guys, and this is just my guess, it's not like those guys have told me anything, but – you know, I think you'll see Porzingis for four minutes to start. Then you'll see Porzingis for six minutes, his second stint, and then they'll bring him out. So you're looking at 10 minutes, like the very first game. They might push that to 12. But, you know, like Al Horford's been good, but Al Horford historically kind of wears down if his minutes are above, like, 30 minutes. So you want to play him around 30. They'll use Porzingis like that. If he's feeling good, I could see him pushing him more in the second half. But everything is, you know, you can control workouts and scrimmages in the practice facility and do all that. One thing, you, it's hard to control an NBA game and how that works. So I think they'll be cautious with him. So if you get to three minutes and Joe Mazzula, it's not Joe Mazzula's mandatory timeout, boom, I can see him just taking him out, maybe bring him back for a couple minutes. But they're not going to stretch him 
seven, eight, nine minutes in a row. They're going to kind of feel how that goes. And if it goes well during game one, they'll probably do the same thing game two plus 10, 20%. And then after that, they might just like, you know, release the rain to let Porzingis go out there and play. I don't know if they'll start them. If they'll start them, expect three stints, right? A start, a comeback, and then probably ending the half. If they bring them off the bench, expect probably two stints, and they're just going to bring them back slow. But it's a lot of time, 40 days off. He was questionable to return maybe game four, game five of the Indiana series if it happened. And then the fact that he got 10 more days off, I'm assuming they're pushing him and doing all they can, but I'm not sure that that's going to, you know, um, they feel totally 100% comfortable just releasing him and allowing him to play 35 minutes in game one. Brian Scalabrini on the DNM leasing hotline on 105 through the fan. What is Kyrie in for in Boston? I mean, he's heard the booze before, you know, and I'm, yeah, I, I'm not in the business of lecturing fans on what to do and not. I'm not going to tell the I'm not going to tell the Dallas fans not to boo for Zingas for whatever reason. I don't. I don't understand how the media guys or former players or anything take those stances. Like, you're not. It's I, fans are going to pay a lot of money. They're going to drink a lot of alcohol. They're going to do what they want. What they're going to do. If they go over the line, get them out. You know, there's things they throw on the court. If uh, they say things that are inappropriate, get them out. But it, Kyrie's definitely going to hear. The booze. The question I have, and maybe you guys would answer this: Does Luca take that personal? And he might. Like, like he's a like we are bona fide savage, right? So, if uh, if Kyrie's getting booed, does Luca say, "No, you're you're booing my brother right here. I'm going to go out there and destroy you"? That's that could be a big problem for Boston. Yeah, I mean, I think we all believe that is the case, but that actually ties in with a question that I was curious about for you as somebody who you play. You hear some people sometimes say clutch is not a real thing or or you know these sort of metrics of you can't just get angry and all of a sudden start playing better when when you see luca lock in and seem to be pissed off and and raise his game do we is, is that an actual factor that that you believe in is the idea of you can you can get somebody who will take that as motivation and level up and and play at a really high level whether that be kyrie going to boston or luca taking it personally on his behalf yeah, I, I can't imagine. Like, it's a, we're not robots over here. You did you guys see the Last Dance where Michael Jordan would just invent things to get mm-hmm. upset about? You know, like this is the greatest player in the world. You're mad at like some eighth man. Like, like I'm sure Luca could do the same thing. I've seen I've seen players do that all the time. Like, players in the NBA over the course of 82 games or playoffs are invent things in their mind to get them upset so they can go to one percent more or. You know, 5% more. That's just the margins that this game is. I, I 100% think, like, Luca is the guy, like, nothing seems to bother him. And he seems to be always, like, looking for a fight. So I, I think, yeah, like, I just, yeah, it could be the, you know, it could be the refs <laughs> as well. But I, I just think, like, that's the guy you don't want to mess with. Scal, uh, Kyrie has made us all look and sound, at least I'll speak for myself, really stupid with this unbelievable transformation as a human being. Uh, what do you attribute that to? How stunned are you over it? And can you think of anyone else that you played with or saw in the league? Like, our test, you know, became really likable and calmed down towards the end with the Lakers. Uh, Rodman kind of didn't. Uh, this Kyrie transformation, your thoughts on it? Yeah, I mean, one, if I had to say, like, the biggest thing that I would point to is you know, Kyrie's not doing all these other things. He's not trying to be the face of the league. And the, uh, the he's not trying to be – it doesn't seem like. I mean, maybe he is in his own mind or whatever. He's not the face of that franchise. If he doesn't play well, no one cares. And, and maybe that you guys do. Yeah. Like, if he has a game where he has nine points and you guys and, – and, you know, you, you drop a game and Luca has, you know, 25 and doesn't shoot well, maybe you guys are talking about Luca's efficiency, right? So he kind of, like, lays in the weeds a little bit. When he was in Brooklyn, it, you know, I think Kevin Durant's like the biggest leader out there. Like, not not like in a negative way. Like, some guys lead like their own way. And so Kyrie kind of became like the voice of the team and kind of put himself in that category. You know, I think when he was with LeBron, he probably wanted to be the face of the team. And then what happened in Boston, remember, him and Gordon Hayward, the two high-profile guys that, post, that were supposed to help this team get over the hump, they were hurt, and the team was like a possession or two away from stopping LeBron and going to an NBA Finals. Like Tatum, Jason Tatum had a three, had that dunk. The crowd's going nuts, and LeBron just like picked apart the team from the last uh, five and a half minutes on. So the following year, 
Kyrie and Gordon Hayward are back, and it's an absolute disaster. I said disaster every single way, disaster defensively, disaster playing time-wise, who's starting, who's coming off the bench. It was a disaster. Now, I'm not blaming that all on Kyrie, but Kyrie was like is the guy that was the face of the team, you know, trying to say the young guys and this guy and that guy and, you know, and, and like they don't really know. I'm going to show them how it's like. And they, they think they're good, but I, I've won a championship. And a lot of guys are probably like rolling their eyes. Like, you won a championship? Well, you won because you have LeBron in your team. That seems to be the common denominator here. So it was, it was a disaster. But it just doesn't seem like all this stuff matters in, in Dallas. And I would say the last thing, it feels from the outside looking in, and maybe you guys know more than I do, it seems like he's really respects Jason Kidd. Maybe he didn't respect Steve Nash or Brad Stevens or whatever the reason, but it seems like, like Jason Kidd has a really good pulse on, on Kyrie Irving and he gets the most out of Kyrie Irving. So, you know, if you have a coach that can connect with players, and I think that's way more important now than it maybe was 10 years ago, but I, I think that Kidd is getting the most out of him and it seems clear to me that he really respects Luka Doncic, which why wouldn't you? The guy's one of the best players in the league. Veal, is it good enough to uh, for, for Tatum just to win the title, or does he need to be the MVP as well? I think he would win the MVP if he wins the title. But, um, you know, Tatum loves these matchups. Like, I think he, like, I think it's underrated as far as when Tatum goes against the best players, he plays differently. And, you know, it's, if it's uh, – the, the one that he hasn't really done – phenomenal against is like the Jimmy Butlers of the world. But for the most part, when he gets to Kevin Durant, he loves it. You know, um, when he goes against, uh, you know, the Anthony Edwards, he loves it. You know, John Morant back in the day, he loved it. Like Luka Doncic, he loves those matchups. So I think Tatum will play well. I think he's really excited about that, that, that idea of going against the Luka Doncic. Now it's probably be careful what you wish for. I'm sure Devin Booker felt the same way. Anthony Edwards felt the same way going into it. We've, we've seen a lot of, Luka Doncic making people look silly along the way, but but it does seem like Jason Tatum really lives for these matchups. And yeah, but I do I do believe that he has to win it. Like where like I don't know I don't know how you guys feel, but Luka doesn't have to win a championship this year. Maybe right. eventually he has to be in that category. And I think we talked before, and I three years ago I was like Luka's not going to be measured based off of how good he is. It's going to be where his legacy is based on championships that he can bring to Dallas. Right? Like that's. That's when you reflect back on Luka Doncic's career, it's going to be like that. But Tatum has had success for a long time. He has a better team. You know, if he gets outplayed by Luka and, uh, and Dallas Mavericks with Kyrie Irving coming, stomping on Lucky's face and winning a championship <laughs> in Boston, that's going to hurt his legacy big time. Brian Scalabrini, former Celtic, former NBA player, Celtics analyst here on 105 Through the Fan. How do you view the coaching matchup? And, and, and what can you tell us about Joe Mazzulla and, and his style and strengths and weaknesses? Yeah, Joe's going to play the numbers. He's going to play the math. And, um, you know, he's not going to overreact to certain things. W one thing about the Celtics, when they're at their best, uh, they're not getting they're, – they're not fouling. They're not putting guys on the line. If Dallas is getting, like, 23 free throws a night, Dallas is going to win this series. But if they can you know, limit that to under 15, which is – I think historically, I think they're the best team in the NBA about limiting free throws, right? That's just the way that they play. So, um that from a defensive side point, they're going to try to do that. Offensively, they're going to want to attack the paint, spread it out, you know, get as many three-point shots as you possibly can. Um, defensively, they're going to do some wild things as far as rotation-wise. Not as standard as you see with, with Dallas, even though Dallas has done so much really good since, uh, I think it was like Jan. Well, no, it would be after the trade. About five games after the trade, their defense went up to a, a level. But it's very standard, right? You want the big at the basket. You want to funnel guys into them. They also do a good job of not putting guys on the line. But, you know, the Celtics are going to play that math game. And I think they are concerned a little bit with uh, P.J. Washington. Like, he seems to be a big-time X factor. And I've always said this about Dallas. If other guys are knocking down shots, they become really hard to beat. So I have a feeling they might take that away. They might play uh, a Luka Doncic one-on-one, -on -one, as long as you can keep him off the free throw line, see what you could do with that. So, um, And obviously, I think Jay Kidd just has a really good pulse for his team defensively. And when you have those two superstar players that can create offense, then those guys could do their thing. As long as you're defending, you can always be in the game. So I think that's kind of how the two matchups in the coaching side work out. And you have Celtics in? So I want to pick, I, like my heart tells me the Celtics will win in six, but 
like I've won a championship and I've won a championship in Boston well, and it's amazing, right? It's like it's like winning at home is like the best feeling in the world. So I just feel I, I feel like it's gonna be a seven game series. I know for sure like Kyrie and Luca are worth one or maybe two wins. So I feel like it's gonna be Celtics in seven. That's what I'm picking. We know that you're a man in high demand. You made a special exception for us. It was well worth it, at least on our end. Thank you so much, Scout, and enjoy the finals. You're the best. Sounds good. Thank you so much.